All right, now this is a synthesis problem. How is this different from the problems that we did uh, before? Well, before we were doing predict the products. In predict the products, you're given just the starting materials, and then you have to figure out the right product. And a good way to do that is by working out the mechanisms. But for synthesis, you're given both the starting materials and the products. So you have to figure out what reagents. Are. That's right. You have to figure out what reagents we have to add to get from the starting materials to the products. So this is a synthesis problem. And there could be more than one step. So we have to watch out for a case where there might be uh, more than one step here. OK, so uh, we can go through together how to do a synthesis problem like this. All right, the first thing we need to do is look for a landmark. Uh, we have to look for an atom in this picture that is the same as an atom in this picture. So can you point to two atoms that you think are probably the same? Mm -hmm. And oh, do you think, well, careful. So who's the same as this atom? Yeah, that's right. And you're saying these two options oh, are the yeah, same. Yeah. Okay, good. So, that's right. So, who's the landmark? The oxygen is the landmark. The oxygen is a landmark that signals that this carbon is probably the same as this carbon. So, let's give them the same number. This is not IUPAC number. We just did the most important step. This is the key to all the synthesis problems to the whole course. Most people get worse and worse at synthesis as the class goes on, and that's because they don't look for landmarks and they don't number the corresponding carbons. So this is the key to all synthesis problems. Look for a landmark that shows you that a carbon in one picture is the same as the carbon in the other picture. And then give them the same number. Obviously, if two carbons are the same, you give them the same number. If we wanted to, we could call this carbon Bob, and then we would call this carbon Bob too, or we can even the morning name of number one. Okay, and now I'll put in some numbers here. I'll call this, say, two and three. Now, can you figure out which carbons are two and three in the other picture? So you suggested that maybe these two carbons are two and three. Now, let's think about it. Notice that uh, carbon two is kind of a methyl group, mm -hmm. and carbon three is kind of a methyl group. So, oh, so it's carbon, so carbon two is Well, yeah, so let's take our time and think about that. So. Oh, no, 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 I get it now. Okay, good. I think this is tricky. This one? All right, I agree with you. You're getting it. Okay. So let's go through that thought process. You can see this is tricky. You have to take your time. Um, so I numbered these, and then the goal is to figure out which carbons in the product are the same as the carbons over here. Well, one thing is these are both methyls. So they probably will still be methyls in the product. So I agree with your guess that this is the number three carbon because this is a methyl, but this is not a methyl group over here, so that doesn't seem, uh, that doesn't seem right. Uh, another way to put it, you could say this is a primary carbon. These are both primaries. They're methyl groups, um, but you can call them primary carbons. Uh, but this is a secondary carbon. All right. Now, it's possible for a carbon to change from primary to secondary, but as a guess, this is not the best guess. So then you guess that maybe this was the primary. Well, that's not a terrible guess, but the number two is supposed to be connected to the number one. By the way, we have not learned any reactions that break carbon-carbon bonds. If you think about it, we have not learned any reactions that break carbon-carbon bonds. Later you will learn some, but very few. It's very hard to break a carbon bond. So far you haven't learned about any ways to break carbon-carbon bonds. So if two carbons are connected in one picture, they must be connected in the other picture. That seems trivial, but that's a very important point for synthesis. At this point in the course, if two carbons are connected in one of your pictures, those same two carbons must be connected in the other picture, because so far in the course, we haven't learned any ways to break carbon-carbon bonds. Eventually, you will learn some ways to break carbon-carbon bonds, but very few. So it's very rare that carbons change partners to different carbons. Uh, or at least it's very rare that a carbon breaks a bond with a carbon. OK. Uh, I think I might not have said that quite right, so let me try again. Because you can't break carbon-carbon bonds if two carbons are connected in the starting material, they should still be connected in the product. That's what I should have said. If two carbons are connected in the starting material, they should still be connected in the product because we can't break that carbon-carbon bond. We have learned ways to form new carbon-carbon bonds. So you can have new carbon-carbon bonds in the product, but you can't break the ones you already have, at least not yet in the course. All right, so as you then guessed, this is best for the number two. Notice that it's perfectly possible for things to kind of rotate in space. So the number two and the three are kind of horizontally arranged here, and here they're kind of vertically arranged, but they're still the same thing. Now, obviously, it doesn't matter whether you call this the two or this the two, because they're symmetrical to each other. You could have called this two and this three. That's not, not what matters. Okay, all right, uh, now I'm going to give numbers to these carbons. 
Now, am I going to call these 1, 2, or 3? Well, absolutely not, because they're not the same as 1, 2, and 3. I have to now start using new numbers. So the logical number here would be 4, 5, and 6. All right, so you have to know when should you reuse numbers and when should you invent new numbers. So I started with these numbers. I reused those numbers over here because these carbons are the same as these carbons over here. But I invented new numbers for these carbons because they are different from any other carbons we've talked about. Okay. Obviously, you don't need to use the same numbers, but you have to have things corresponding upright. Okay. So, there we are so far. All right. Um, now, we are going to be turning a carbonyl into an alcohol. Um, so, uh, do you remember? Uh, and notice that we're going to do that by forming a new carbon-carbon bond. So, another thing that helps is, um, obviously, which of the carbons here is going through change? Carbon going through. Say again? Carbon, carbon. Yeah, the carbon number one. Exactly what changes are happening? Let's be as specific as possible. Exactly what changes are happening? A carbon chain is being attached to it. Let's be even more specific. The number one is going to attach to who? The number one is going to attach to, to which carbon? The number four carbon. That's right. That's what I mean by being as specific as possible. Um, it helps to put in a little squiggle for bonds that are forming or breaking. So I'm going to put a squiggle there. Not because this bond is breaking, but because it got formed. So you can use a squiggle for a bond that formed or broke. So this is the important change. Obviously, the other change is that we lost the pi bond to the oxygen. Maybe I'll put a squiggle here, too. But the really interesting thing is forming a carbon-carbon bond. Why is it so interesting when we form a carbon-carbon bond? Because we only know kind of one way to do that. So, so with a grignard, it yeah. has a ketone, right? Yeah, so we're going to use a grignard. Now, the hard part is to come up with the right grignard. So let's very carefully try to figure out uh, what the correct uh, grignard would be. Uh, that would uh, lead to this. We need three more carbons. Yeah, so I'll make one, two, three carbons, and um, let's keep numbering. Six, five, and four. All right, maybe you can finish that off now and make it into the green that we need. Oh, that's good. So we need to add these three carbons. Now, where do we need the negative charge to be? On which carbon? The four carbon. Right. Not the number five. Maybe in another problem we need it on the five, but here we need it on the four. Or the six, but we might as well put it on the five over here. And then you put in your counter ion. Oh, I should have put the arrow like this. So basically, if we use this uh, starting material, we can get to here. Uh, in fact, if we put these two things here together, these two things together would basically take us to here. Right? Why is it positive? Oh, I'm sorry, this just means plus. Oh, okay. If I want to put in a positive charge, I would circle it. Yeah. You might have noticed that I usually uh, circle the charges, and that's so that we don't get them confused with a plus sign. Okay. Uh, but these are just two separate things. All right. Now, um, something I want to explain is, uh, let's go back here. Think about what we just did. We focused on the product, and we asked what starting material would that come from, or what intermediate or what reagent would that come from. We focused on the product, and we worked backwards to figure out what uh, reagent that would come from. Now, notice that that is a kind of uh, awkward or, uh, or unusual way of thinking. You're, you're not used to thinking backwards like that. You're used to focusing on starting materials and asking what products come from them. What you're used to doing is focusing on the starting materials and asking what product you will get. But that's not the main way we solved this problem. The main way we solved the problem was by focusing on the product and asking what starting material or reagent would lead to it, thinking backwards. Well, there's a name for that new thinking process. The name for that new thinking process, do you know what that name is? That, okay, so very good. So the first thing you said was working backwards. That would be a great name. Yeah, if I was the king of the universe, it would be called working backwards. Yeah. Uh, but since I'm not the king of the universe, this is called retrosynthesis. So synthesis of the Grignard is retrosynthesis? Ah, uh, no, let's clarify that a little bit. It has nothing to do with the Grignard. Okay. Um, Just working backwards. Working backwards from the product to the starting material that gave you is retrosynthesis. And again, uh, I would prefer just to call that working backwards, because it's clear what it means. But that's what retrosynthesis means, right? Retro means backwards, right? Working backwards from what? Working backwards from the product. 
Now, let me try to clarify this as much as I can, because students get very confused about this. Um, what are the types of problems that we've done today? Well, we did predict the products at the start. We did a bunch of predict the products where I give you the starting materials and you predict the products. And here I gave you a synthesis problem where you're given both the starting materials and the product and you have to figure out the reagents. Retrosynthesis is not like that. Retrosynthesis is not a type of problem. Predict the products is a type of problem. Synthesis is a type of problem. Retrosynthesis is a technique for solving synthesis problems. Retrosynthesis is just a technique for solving synthesis problems. So you're never going to see a retrosynthesis problem. Retrosynthesis is just a technique for solving synthesis problems. And all it means is, is the technique of solving a synthesis problem by working backwards from the product. Uh, so I think people get very confused about that.